I have the pleasure today to, to introduce you a little bit in our, how to say, our baby for years. Um, because we started with a vision in 2006, 2007, and you even see it's as old as OPC UA. And this vision was plug and work. And uh, plug and work seems to be very easy. Um, and the idea was to create something like USB in production or something similar to USB. But the problem is that production is not uh, the personal computer domain. So um, you cannot compare those two domains and you cannot compare the mechanisms, the techniques and also the, uh, the, the fragmenting of all the, the partners which are involved. So um, this leads um, to, uh, yeah, to s somehow the work we are doing right now with automation ML and OPC UA and the information modeling. But uh, the basis on that um, is even yeah, something else, um, I would say. So what I, will, um, yeah, what I will show today is something like the plug and work principles, but really on a high level, um, just to, to be sure that um, the idea behind is clear. And then the goals, what we had in, in mind when we are, were creating the companion specification and also now the um, DEAN specification, which is the way to international standardization for the specification right now. And for sure, I also will show some examples uh, to give a clear vision of what you can do with that, because uh, just modeling for having some information model is not the goal, but uh, really to use it in the end and to do something with it. So uh, the motivation is really that we have continuous changes in production systems and that you have to do a lot of re-engineering. And re-engineering involves all tools which you are using for planning um, production plans but also for the components. And uh, the problem is that you have a, a lot of tools. So normally, um, yeah, all the, the projects um, you do um, there are a lot of people involved, a lot of tools involved, and this is good how it is because it works. Uh, so you can't say, okay, the, the future will be that you only have one tool, um, but you, you need all those people, you need all the disciplines, you need their know-how and you need the tools. Um, but you have a lot of objects uh, which can change. So not only the products, like product variants, new products, or um, yeah, individual products which are coming right now with the <coughs> Industry 4.0 idea, um, but also you have technological or logistical processes which are changing, or parts of the manufacturing facilities, which means, for example, that um, you, you change um, yeah, the, the PLC um, generation. Uh, which is a really big uh, challenge. Or you change software systems because you, you want to have a new MES with new functionality. So you have really have a lot of changes which can occur and in each case, in each of these um, yeah, change cases, you have to do a re-engineering and you have to, uh, you have to plan your, your plans, you have to uh, um, reprogram your PLCs, for example, you have to redesign um, your products. Um, so this means that you normally should exchange a lot of information during that process. But in fact today, um, this is not the case. This means that normally you exchange information via people, so that someone tells someone else uh, the facts or the things uh, which had changed. Um, in some cases you use the universal engineering tool Microsoft Excel, uh, which is very, very um, yeah, well known. Um, but in, in some cases you also have proprietary interfaces. But the problem is if two version changes, if the interfaces of one tool change, um, you have to re-implement also these interfaces. And this is where, where OPC UA comes and really gives you an advantage because this is um, a fixed standard, you can rely on that and you can be sure that if you program an OPC UA interface, it's not uh, yeah, the, the thing that after half a year you have to re-implement re it because you can rely on that technology. And the same thing is uh, with Automation ML, but Automation ML has a completely different focus. Automation ML is only there for describing um, engineering information. So this means that um, if you look at OPC UA and the OPC information models, Automation ML is one of them. 
So one thing to describe your production world, your processes, your tools, uh, the, the information they exchange. And um, yeah, what, what you want to achieve um, also for, for doing plug and work is interoperability as we heard today already from Stefan. Um, but the, the problem is that normally you, you have this situation. You have, for example, one washing machine um, which uh, had a protocol from 10 years ago, but the machine still runs. So you can't change the whole machine. Uh, sometimes you do not even have um, maintenance uh, contracts with the manufacturer, for example, for these machines or m lines. Um, you, for example, you have a robot which has a special uh, protocol and you can have, for example, machines like these grippers or uh, the tool manufacturers which are perhaps providing an OPC UA interface. But at that point, um, the OPC UA interface comes with the information model from the vendor. And you can be sure that, for example, for, for machine tools, this is not the same thing as for grippers. So you have to bring those things together somehow. And um, this is okay for, for a, um, an operator which only has um, yeah, five or ten types of machines. But imagine if you're in, in the automotive dom domain, for example, you really have a lot of different things. You really have a lot of different versions. You have a lot of different interfaces and you have to bring all that together to, to get it working. And some, sometimes the, the automotive manufacturers, they have their specific um, standards. Um, so this means, for example, at Daimler, you have the Integra standard. So they describe what they want from their suppliers. But this is not in, in every case um, the, yeah, the, the, the right way to go. Because you have a lot of effort for these, maintaining these uh, proprietary standards. You have a lot of money which you pay to your suppliers uh, to support the standard. And also the automotive domain, for example, goes in that direction that they uh, want to have something more general. And as I said, more general means on the one hand you have OPCA for communication, for data management, for integration, for security things, but you have to uh, to build up upon the, the general basis of the information model which is provided, you have to build up your specific information. And automation ML is one way for doing that. Um, but let's come back to the plug and work thing. So the within this industry 4.0 community, there's a platform industry 4.0 in Germany, and they also define a glossary. So this means that uh, people are arguing about terms. Um, and one of these terms was plug and work, um, and it, it was defined as setting up modification termination of interoperation between two or more involved parties with minimal effort. And you see it's a very general definition, but this minimal effort, this is the thing which you want to achieve. So you, you want to set up something and you do not want to repeat all things, um, all your work every time you change something but you want to have mechanisms uh, which, um, yeah, which make it easy to exchange information. So this minimum effort can vary depending on the state of the art, um, but for example with OPC UA and Automation ML, um, it can be very minimum. So um, this is yeah, the, the first thing. But as, as we look now, for example, what you exchange. So um, if you look at OPC UA or at normal, yeah, le legacy communication, you have signals. With OPC UA, you have something like resource objects, and if you put on top of that um, semantic models, you, you really can transport with OPC UA the meaning of the, the objects uh, you communicate. And these semantic models are the comp uh, companion specifications. So this means that for every domain, for every, how to say, every um, different aspect, there is a a best practice recommendation how to model that and you do not have to start at the beginning if you are in this domain. So for example if you are looking at um, RFID, uh, the RFID um, companion specification, you see that uh, with this information model um, there are vendors who can rely on that and they do not have to define it once again for every uh, single application which they realize. And um, what you want to, uh, 
to do is really that you have something for each machine, um, like a plug and work hardware or software, which gives you simplified access, but also the unified comprehension. Because you cannot um, yeah, argue about the, the variables you have, for example, you must be sure that everyone is able to uh, to um, to um, interpret the, the information which is given without directly communicating to the vendor. So this is what the companion specifications help for. And um, what what we are doing is that we are combining um, automation ML for component description. Um, which can be used for also for the selection of components, uh, feasible components, and for the component access, but also for the control afterwards and during the operation phase um, with OPC UA. And um, this combination um, yeah, relies on that you have something like a description, self-description of the component in Automation ML, which you put into the OPC UA server of the component. So this means, for example, that if you have such a gripping system, it comes and it says, OK, I can grip, I can have different um, tools um, which I can use, I can have those skills, I can have different possibilities for communication. So this means, for example, that you can describe um, within the self-description the whole OPC UA address space. Um, so that you do not um, have to use the discovery mechanism. This is one possibility. But on the other hand, you put this whole description into the OPC UA server of the component. This means that if you are, the component is the, uh, delivered to a customer, he connects to this OPC UA server, he reads out the, the configuration, this description, and he can immediately um, do something uh, because he knows which um, yeah, communication is provided, which methods the component provides, for example, which can be, uh, um, yeah, which can be executed. But you have, to be, uh, yeah, you have to be sure if you put that sensitive information onto one component and deliver it, that you secure, can secure it. And this was also one point today already, um, this yeah, communication. Um, is really, really um, yeah, important and um, also the possibility, to, for example, to, to give access only to authorized people. So, for example, based on, on security mechanisms, based on, for example, even hardware anchors for security, um, you can combine all that with OPC UAs, so you don't need another technology for that. And this is also very, very important for this plug and work idea because um, if uh, yeah, you say to a, to a, for example, machine vendor that he has to put his whole communication model into an online server, they are really afraid of that normally. But if you can ensure them that you have the possibility to, um, to close that um, description and only give access to authorized people where you deliver, for example, um, security certificates or something like that. Then they are, yeah, they're, they're just a little bit open and, and um, hear what you are telling them. And um, this is really one thing um, which, yeah, everybody has to think of when, when talking about plug and work and all these industry for zero ideas. Because you, you're really giving, if you're building such components and such descriptions, you're really giving information to the outside world. And you have to be sure that nobody of your competitors, for example, can do anything with it. Uh, you have to be sure that, for example, you can guarantee, even if you provide such methods, that you can guarantee that only authorized personnel is able to uh, execute those methods. And um, this is really important that um, you, you have something like a, a neutral description for that with the information model. But you, you also have the possibilities to test it, to, to be sure that this really works. And this is where, where OPC UA is really doing a good job because of, uh, for example, the profiles um, which you can define because of the security mechanism, because of um, conformance testing certification. And these are all little, um, yeah, little modules for those vision for plug and work, um, which are normally um, the, the barriers you have to cross uh, when you're going into industry and not doing, how to say, future work or prototypes or something like that. But this is really the, the case for PCOA. 
and um, automation ML to this end describes therefore the, the production system components, their skills as I said. And um, it gives you the possibility also to, um, yeah, to include um, methods for automatic matching or comparison so that you can say, okay, I need a gripper right now. Uh, which constraints the, does the component has to fulfill? Is there a matching component, for example? And um, it's really important that you, you, um, yeah, you can, how to say, you can implement such a s selection process. And this is also what, for example, for those marketplaces uh, which are um, yeah, growing up right now, um, this, this, these selection um, principles, they're, they're really um, important because it, if you cannot compare those different things together with some general properties, for example, um, you, you really cannot have such a matching process. And um, for sure, Automation ML provides the possibility, if combined with OPC UA, to describe also the X path to the function. So this means that if you say there is a um, transport process which can be affected from a point A to point B, how to uh, um, to initiate this process, and sure, the the possibility is to create an OPC UA method for that for the component, which has some parameters uh, to give, with have, uh, which have some restrictions. Um, and uh, automation ML is the, the possibility to describe this. On the other hand, um, as I mentioned, you, you really have to, uh, to be sure that um, yeah, the, the uh, universal combination of components is um, possible. So this means that you cannot be restricted to only use Bad example, ABB robots and not KUKA robots together. So normally you rely on one of those, but um, or you, you cannot, for example, you must be able to combine different PLCs from different vendors. And this is really the case if you, for example, are an operator in the automotive domain, you normally have your standard PLC. But if you need, for example, a machine, um, a special machine, and this machine only comes with another PLC, you have to use this. You can force your supplier to some, some end, but this costs a lot of money. And um, this is why you really have to, to see from practical reason um, that normally you do not have everything from one vendor, so you have to combine those things. And even with the, the field bus protocols, for example, um, in, the, uh, in the MES domain, you, you would um, always use something more simple. So for example, for, for the connecting supervising systems or some things OPC AOA is really dedicated to. So um, all this work started in 2014. So you see, we, we, it took a long time uh, to, um, to be sure how to combine those two technologies. Um, but we have a lot of partners which are also implementing that in their tools, for example. And um, it's, it's really um, yeah, yeah, good to see that, for example, with this companion specification, which was published in February 2016, um, we, uh, we had the first step. And after the, the first implementations, we've seen that we still need more, so that we still need more detailed property matching between those two um, information models. We still need it. Um, yeah, the, the, the back way round, so to, to describe how to access OPC UA within automation ML models. And this was now defined in this Dean spec, which is a German uh, pre standard, um, something, yeah, you can call it like that, but it, it was written in English and it will come soon. So it's in the publication process and uh, we are just waiting for the editorial. Um, yeah, things from Dean, so I think that in, in one or two months this will also be publicly available. And um, the thing is that with this step towards standardization, this is always a, a good thing, for example, for, for big companies to be sure that this thing will not change in, in three months and six months, for example, and to rely on that. On the other hand, in this Dean spec, uh, we really discussed with people which were not used to, uh, uh, for example, on the one hand automation ML, on the other OPC UA in the beginning, um, about use cases. 
So this means that um, it's good to combine those two technologies, but uh, for, for which reason, um, for which use cases you want to use that? And uh, these use cases were, um, yeah, were selected, uh, were classified over the life cycle, so over the planning phases. And you see that there are nine use cases. And um, we have a set of actors which are involved in those use cases. Um, for example, the um, plant operator um, or the maintenance personnel. And um, if we look at the, the goals, for example, if you integrate automation ML in OPC UA, the goal is for sure to communicate operationalize automation ML via an OPC UA server, for sure. Um, and um, that you have this information model. But the, the result is that you can exchange also automation ML models, the descriptions which you normally pass by passing XML files. And um, on the other hand, the benefit you have is um, you, yeah, you simplify the creation of OPC UA information models for your server because if you reuse the planning information in automation ML, uh, you do not have to discuss once again how to set up, for example, the object model in your server. So uh, where to use this is for sure the re-engineering and maintenance use cases. Um, and um, just to show some of them is, for example, if you want to have an up-to-date description of the system as is. Normally you have your planning phase. In the end of your planning phase, you have your planning documents. Then everything goes into operation. And uh, the first... Um, yeah, the, the first thing is the start at the ramp-up phase, where the, the technical people um, at the shop floor, they change, for example, some parameters. Um, normally, you never know in the planning um, what they changed. And this is really a thing that you, you don't get back this information because it's really, really uh, high effort to do this. Uh, but if you have your OPC UA server with your model, and these parameters are changed, you directly have it in the OPC UA information model and you can reuse it because um, yeah, exporting this, this model back to automation ML is easy and importing this automation ML model back to your planning tools means that you have the up-to-date information in your planning tools, for example, for the next replanning step. And one thing which we frequently discuss is um, to use this, um, yeah, this data, this um, model, what you have during the operation phase because if you imagine you have such a machine and in this machine there are components and these components they also communicate for example some spindles um, and um, normally the vendor of the spindles they never get any information about their components in the op operation during the operation phase. But with an OPC UA server, with their model, um, which can, can store information, they are able to log um, yeah, history um, to have a yeah, persistent storage for that. And they are able to get those parts of their, their models and the usage of their components during operation back. Um, normally, every, every operator would say that it's not possible to get data from the operation, but if they, for example, provide longer guarantee times um, by using that information, this is a, yeah, a use case where really the, the operators and the, the component suppliers come together. Um, unfortunately, for example, the legal situation in Germany is that you would need a direct contract to do that. So really you have to discuss not with your customer, but with the end user of your component to do that at the moment. But perhaps this will also change a little bit um, when we have upcoming uh, platforms uh, for that things um, and you do the contracts via these platforms. On the other hand, if you um, yeah, integrate OPC UA configuration information in Automation ML, um, you have the parameters to set up the OPC UA communication in directly in your description model. This means that, for example, you can pre-configure all your, your clients without really having the need that you discover all the servers which are there, that you browse their information model. Because, for example, you can specify that for um, a certain skill of a component, you have a method. This method is available via an OPC UA node, 
and you directly enter this information within the automation ML model. So you have these parameters. So this means um, for, for the application, if you really set up big OPCA networks, um, for, for the first time discovery, the, the, all these mechanisms are there. But if you really do this uh, with a large amount of data and with um, yeah, many, many components, um, sometimes it's easier to go over such, such configuration data, also to test those things. And um, the use cases for sure is the exchange of OPC UA system configuration so that you can also store where to, to read, write your information from your plant. Um, but for example, and this is one, one really important use case, uh, you combine reproduction with uh, simulation. And there you really have the, the possibility just to, to switch, for example, the description of the OPC UA server. One, on one hand, you start with a simulated server or within the simulation environment. And on the other hand, if you then go into operation, you just switch the, in brief, the IP address of the, of, of the server where it's available. And um, you can test and, and validate there are many things. But you can also have an, um, yeah, a support for manufacturing change management to describe changes, for example, which should happen. Because normally this is done in documents and not in an online server. And uh, this is the point where you can, for example, describe those changes within the automation ML model. And you can pass it to, for example, your supplier, which you, you, you have to provide um, the information. And um, one thing where, where you can also use it is um, if, for example, you're setting up um, visualization. So this means, for example, for, for the supervising level for SCADA systems, for MES, um, you need not only the information which components you visualize, but also which information they provide, which communication variables. And um, these um, systems normally they all provide an API or um, even an XML interface to be configured. And one example is um, from Siemens WinCC. They have an, um, it's called ODK, so a programming interface. And you can just use such automation ML descriptions to completely configure your, your images and not to, to draw them uh, like it would do at the moment. And um, this is really a, um, yeah, um, a good use case when you have uh, a lot of data, a lot of things to, uh, to configure. Normally one, uh, one of the, the um, application engineers draws such images uh, for, for, one, um, yeah, for one plant, for example. This takes a lot of time. So for each of the components, two days, for example, in the automotive domain. And if you count that, he's really, he's drawing Every, uh, everything, he's connecting all the variables, he's testing all that. Um, this is really a big effort and it's really, um, how to say, a d disgusting thing. Because yeah, you really have to concentrate on the list of variables, you have to be sure that they are there. And this is really a thing which can be uh, simply automated. And um, for this automation you need a description <coughs> format, uh, but you also need uh, information about the connection points. And the description format for sure is in this case automation ML, and uh, the connection points for, for this um, communication are the OPC UA variables of the OPC UA servers, which are available in the field. So, um, what we are doing, uh, because we are researchers, um, we uh, cannot, how to say, test those things normally in real plants, um, only in prototypical things or in some demo. Um, environments if we are developing. So we also have plants uh, yeah, in Karlsruhe. But um, in, the, in the past there were also um, yeah, some research projects which deal with automation ML and OPC UA also in combination. And um, I just put here um, the links to these projects. So for example, uh, we also had some, some European projects with Finnish partners from the University of Aalto, but also um, from visual components, for example. And um, it's really, um, yeah, the, the fact that um, within the, the research area, OPC UA and then automation ML are very accepted. But in, in practice, this is just upcoming in the last years. So we've seen that, for example, 
10 years ago, nobody would have um, built something upon automation ML. But uh, for example, at the moment, um, Daimler is really um, requesting automation ML as description format for, for new plants, for example. So um, this is really changing. And um, one of the, the factors why this is changing is industry 4.0 for sure, because everybody wants to have something, some use case for industry 4.0, some prototypes and demo. And um, everybody is announcing that um, there is an industry 4.0 component, for example. And um, Stefan already mentioned this um, Dean Speck, this reference architecture model for industry 4.0. But if we look, for example, as, um, on, at this architecture model, you see that, um, as Stefan already mentioned, there are some technologies which can be used for different parts of the reference architecture. And two of those which were named in the, already in the first documents were automation ML and OPC UA. And it's the same thing for, for the IIC, uh, IIC um, reference architecture, the ERA. Um, they already also mentioned some technologies, so they do not say that there's one technology which is fitting for all, and I think this would not be the case also in the, in the future. But um, there are some examples which can be used for different applications, for different use cases, for different domains. And if you look at, for example, this Industry 4.0 component, um, OPC UA is perfectly fitting for the communication part, so for the component manager, which is the, the communication thing to the outside world. And Automation ML, for sure, is fitting for the manifest, the description of the assets within the component, and their <coughs> properties, for example, their descriptions. And um, what is really impressive with these two technologies is that they are very, very open. So this means that Automation ML and OPC UA, they do not say you have to use OPC UA and you can use nothing um, beside. But OPC UA is explicitly open and says, okay, you use OPC UA and you combine it with this, 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 and this. And Automation ML goes the same ap approach for um, planning data. So Automation ML also says, okay, you can use Automation ML, but if you have, for example, uh, electronic device descriptions, you link them in. You, or, for example, if you have um, a de device model, you just uh, yeah, interlink it with the Automation ML model. You do not do a, um, a redefinition of information which you already have. And this is really for both technologies the case. And this is why I think this, these technologies are really for future, um, yeah, for full, dedicated for future work. But that, um, yeah, they're really. Um, yeah, good to, to survive, um, to say it like that, because if you have um, company strategies, you cannot, um, yeah, you cannot decide against them. So this means, for example, if a company decided to go for a step with 3D modeling, they cannot say, okay, it's nice that we have all the models, but we now say, change for Koyada. So this means that this is, this is not um, yeah, realistic in practice. And um, this is why really OPC UA and, and Automation ML um, yeah, get, have the, the possibility, the opportunity um, to, um, to be integrated um, for future things to be used, um, but uh, to be used in combination with other things. And um, just for, for showing a short conclusion, um, for, for our starting point or our idea behind this combination of Automation ML and uh, OPC UA was this plug and work idea. Um, nowadays, it's, uh, we are doing a lot of other things with this combination, but this was the first thing why we, we had it for that. Um, we have the companion specification, which is available on the OPC UA website. And we have coming soon uh, this first standardization document uh, towards inter international standardization with the extended mapping rules and the description of the use cases and the relation to other standards and specifications. And um, for sure, the, the work is not over. Uh, so the current um, yeah, work of, the, of this joint working group of Automation ML and OPC um, Foundation um, is uh, related to, on the one hand, the uh, um, um, standardized uh, description of the integration of OPC UA configuration data in Automation ML, but on the other hand, to harmonize with other companion specs. So 
So this means that, for example, AutomationML describes also um, IEC 624, 664 um, hierarchy levels uh, in roles, and we have this um, OPC UA companion spec for the ISA 95. So um, if you use both in common, you have to define how to do that. Uh, because if not, you cannot um, describe two facts in, um, in the same OPC UA information model beside. So this means that this harmonization is a really big effort with which we are um, working on, I think, um, already since last year. Um, but we have um, one thing, or ha we have the, the, the solution, the, the best practice recommendation for combining um, OPC UA for automation ML with OPC UA for devices. Um, we have a, um, a recommendation for combining OPC UA with ISA 95 and we're just working on um, OPC UA uh, for FDI in combination with OPC UA for automation ML. Um, and for the PLC Open, there's already an approach um, described too within the scene spec. So this means that this harmonization fact is really one thing which you see either on, on this industry 4.0 domain, but also on the uh, industrial internet domain. Um, because you're, you're, we are not living in a, how to say, in a brave new world, uh, we cannot um, yeah, skip everything we, we did in the past. Uh, so this means that we have to reuse everything we have um, to, uh, to really yeah, be sure that the solutions for the future are valuable and usable. And if you want to have current information about the working group, just go to this website and this is the end. I want to thank you. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to ask. Thank you.